after hitting the midseason skids a few episodes ago. Dallas rebounds in a big way with Lover Come Back, which features the end of J.R. Ewing's quest to overthrow the Southeast Asian government, and the return of one of the most popular characters from season three. We pick things up where we left off last episode with Sue Ellen looking like she's seen a ghost. And maybe she has. Was it Dusty Farlow? I appreciate that logically the writers couldn't have her avoid the question very long, but it does make the reveal later in the episode anticlimactic. And of course, this also complicates Sue Ellen's burgeoning affair with Clint Ogden. Speaking of affairs, JR has his own affair. A foreign affair. JR's Southeast Asia fixer, Hank Johnson, calls to let JR know that the woodchuck has stuck gold and will be dropping the pigeons off at the swimming pool at dawn. Actually, he just straight out says that the country is going to be overthrown. JR is so confident that he puts into motion Operation In Your Face, Jordan Lee. Speaking of faces and things that are in them, Cliff Barnes is feeling sorry for himself. And we finally get a Cliff and Pamela scene after what feels like forever. Cliff thinks that Bobby taking the Senate seat is just another in an itemized list of 30 years of disagreements. But Pamela defends Bobby with damning praise, saying that he's actually too self-absorbed to think of Cliff in the first place. Cliff just wants to wallow in self-pity though, so he kicks Pamela out. Speaking of wallowing in self-pity, it sounds like Jordan Lee has gotten out of the oil business and into the salty bitch business. I imagine people don't know JR. Think you and all is good company to do business with. The cartel is willing to hear JR out, but I would be remiss in not mentioning the exchange between Marilee Stone and JR, in which JR gives a Homer Simpson like retort. You caused poor Seth to kill himself. I didn't ask you all here to nitpick about the past. Look, we could go back and forth all day about who drove whose husband to suicide. But JR really brought them there to show off his latest magic trick. He got the Southeast Asian oil wells back for them. And suddenly, everyone wants to buy a billion shares of JR Ewing, including Leslie Stewart. I will say this about Leslie Stewart's character and a good thing that the writers have done. Now that we know that she's recording every conversation, there is this kind of hanging sort of Damocles over JR's head as the audience awaits to see if he'll say anything incriminating. JR admits that he had no idea if the coup was successful when he put Hank Johnson on the phone, but if it hadn't been, he would have asked for an A for effort anyway. Either way, JR wins. In the requisite sledgehammer of a plot scene, Pamela tries to get a word in edgewise, but all of Bobby's advisors keep drowning her out. But in fairness, Bobby does give her a very important job. Honey, you know where everything is. Would you go out and brew up a couple pots? We got a lot of stuff to talk about. And with that out of the way, they can talk about the Equal Rights Amendment. In the episode's most shocking scene, Sue Ellen does burst into the mansion she followed the guy to, only to find a wheelchair-bound, but very much still alive, Dusty Farlow. Dusty explains that he miraculously survived the plane crash, but it left him paralyzed. It was actually one of the Farlow ranch hands who died in the plane crash, and he was misidentified as Dusty Farlow. And Dusty has just been rolling around Denton ever since, laying low. Dusty tells her that he'll be confined to the wheelchair for the rest of his life, and Sue Ellen, in a tour de force performance by Linda Gray, tells him she doesn't care, she just loves him. This is one of my favorite moments of the season, because Sue Ellen doesn't get a whole lot of happiness, especially in those first few years. But when she does, Dusty Farlow is usually the reason. And it has been a really bad year for Sue Ellen. Over at the Coopers, the jig is up. Mitch fires the housekeeper that Lucy had hired, thus denying an old lady on a fixed income some extra scratch. Well, I hope he's happy, him and his pride. A working class hero is something to be, Mitch. Over at the Cattlemen's Club, Punk Anderson is getting nervous about the momentum the DOA is building. Ray volunteers to smooth things over with Donna Culver to try to get him to shut up. Back at Ewing headquarters, Pamela is, of course, contributing as best she can. And JR appears, I still think in a puff of smoke, to point out how great they look side by side. He's so catty. Anyway, the gist is that Bobby is way ahead and it looks like he's going to be the next senator. Pamela is upset that no one is taking her seriously, even though she's left alone with Bobby and could easily just tell him what's on her mind, but she opts not to do that and instead glares at the back of his head. Of course, Bobby is clueless, so he has no idea that she's upset. This is just classic Pamby. At the Cooper Hut, Mitch accuses Lucy of betrayal and hiring a housekeeper, which is a little bit melodramatic, Mitch. 
Lucy apologizes and agrees not to spend any money that they don't have. So we have a character coming back from the dead, a Southeast Asian coup, and Mitch is upset that someone else is vacuuming his apartment. Working class hero is something to be. This is what qualifies for drama in the Cooper household. No wonder these two had to be written off the show. At Ewing Oil, JR makes plans with Marilee Stone, but then gets a better offer from Leslie Stewart. We find out that Dusty was the one who secretly bonded Sue Ellen out of jail when she was arrested for shooting JR, solving a mystery nearly 15 episodes old. Dusty admits to hiring someone to follow Sue Ellen just to see how she was. Okay, it's not as creepy when he does it. They both admit to still loving each other and the thing that I wish for every single human being on the planet is that someone will look at them the way that Linda Gray looks at Jared Martin. At Leslie Stewart's, you can see Leslie just baiting JR to say the words. But he won't take the bait. You were smart enough to overthrow a foreign government. Oh, now, Leslie, I told you before, I, I can't take credit for that. She also says that they should just tear up her contract because JR doesn't really need her anymore. JR disagrees, saying that he really likes what she's done with the place. She tells him that if they're going to work together, he needs to trust her completely and not keep her in the dark on all of his shady dealings. JR implies that they're going to have to be a lot more intimate before he can trust her that way. Donna Culver was under the impression that romance was being rekindled with Ray, but he just invited her out to talk about Takapa. Donna rightly says that he's just a cowboy, and what does he know about developing anyway? I feel like this is a moment that Ray internalized and repeats over the next seven seasons. Way to go, Donna. It's also clear that Ray wanted some sexy time reconciliation. And honestly, can you blame him? At breakfast, Lucy asks Pam to get her a job. She doesn't know how to do much of anything, but she knows that Pam is in good with Alex Ward and Alex Ward is starting a new magazine, so maybe Lucy can be a model. She knows how to be pretty, so that's one way out around Mitch's admonition not to spend money they don't have. Just make more money. Over at Ray's place, he laments not spending more time with Donna. But he's going to rectify that by marrying her. Well, that was quick. Donna was Team Cliff just a few episodes ago. In another understated debut that I'm sure no one saw the significance of at the time, we meet Clayton Farlow, Dusty's father, played by the great Howard Keel. So Ellen says she doesn't care about the wheelchair, but Clayton says the big thing that Dusty can't get over is that he's impotent. The doctors say he may never bone again. Ray tells Jock that he forgot all about Takapa, but he did get engaged. Jock seems really happy because Donna's quite the catch. At the store, Pam arranges for Lucy to audition for Alex Ward. Cliff suddenly has a new reason for life, proving that JR was somehow responsible for the Southeast Asian Revolution. Dusty finally arrives back home, but his appointment did not go well. Dusty sends her away, despite Sue Ellen openly saying that she doesn't care about that. She just wants to spend her life with a man who loves her. It's the thing that she's been craving her entire adult life. I just thought I needed a little something to change my image. That's okay. not you. Jill, we don't make love anymore. I thought you loved me. I do. I do, in my own way. My entire life up until this point has been a mockery. Dusty is still hung up on sex, though. Feeling like less than a man. I'm incapable of making love. I needed any confirmation of that. I just got it today at the doctor. You know, you can work around that. For example, what does your dentist say about sexual activity? Eat it, that's all you eat it. Eat as much of it as you can and you keep eating it. Oh, I'm sorry, Batman doesn't do that. Swillen begs him to reconsider, but Dusty just isn't there yet. Over at South Fork, Donna and Ray announce their engagement, and everyone is happy except for Miss Ellie and JR, because Jock went behind their back and cut Ray in as an equal partner in their trust fund. After all, he's just as much Jock's son as JR, Bobby, or the other one. And we're out. We'll have a lot more to say in the future about the return of Dusty Farlow, the debut of Clayton Farlow, Donna and Ray's reconciliation, and JR's cat and mouse games with Leslie Stewart. Just know that all four of these things give the season a much needed shot in the arm. The days of Alex Ward and Clint Ogden are nearly over. And while I wasn't really a fan of either man's relationship with their respective partners, the Dallas writers are about to leverage them to spin the characters into new directions. Sue Ellen, for example, is about to learn who she is and who she wants to be. 
and that's going to be really important for season 5. And Lucy's about to find something interesting to do besides get her MRS degree. In the long run, that's not good for her, but it is, at least, interesting. And although it doesn't look like it, JR is actually painting himself into a corner here. We'll see how that corner collapses and how he gets his way out of it. But for now, let's just celebrate Dusty's return. 